Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience and holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware that each of your line is in a listen-only mode. You may submit your questions electronically anytime by using the chat pod located at the right of your webinar platform. You may also download a copy of today's presentation using the files pod located directly below the presentation. It is now my pleasure to turn the conference over to today's first presenter, Chris Hunt. Thank you, Katie. Hi, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you're coming from. Uh, my name is Chris Hund, Senior Director with the American Hospital Association Center for Health Innovation. And I'm really happy to welcome you here today to the special July 2021 event here uh, with our partners from Sharp Healthcare. And this particular webinar is entitled Clinical Communication and Cerner Careware Connect. Uh, and so this webinar is sponsored by our partners at Cerner, so we're very thankful for them sponsoring today's webinar. And I'd like to also introduce today's speakers, who are both from Sharp Healthcare System, which is in San Diego, California, which is probably having better weather than Chicago, where I am today, where it's gray and rainy and kind of humid. Uh, but our two speakers today, our first one is Chrissy Basilaire, and she is the VP of Workforce Strategy and Support Services with Sharp. And then our second speaker is Jonathan Anderson, who is the IT Manager for Clinical Applications with Sharp Healthcare. So they are going to both give you a great presentation today, and then I'll rejoin at the end where we'll do some Q&A. The way we'd like to do Q&A is for you to drop your questions in the chat pod that you see on screen right now. This is the best way to ask questions because I'll grab all those questions, turn them into some sort of uh, well-flowing Q&A, hopefully, and that's how we'll finish everything up today. So don't wait until the end. Drop your questions in as you have them, and we'll have a great presentation. So without further ado, I would like to turn things over to you, Chrissy. Have a great presentation. Thank you very much, and welcome, everyone. I'm going to start um, our uh, kickoff of our presentation with our learning agenda. So our, our, we're going to start with some learning objectives, a little bit about Sharp Healthcare, why we went with CareWare Connect at Sharp, our project governance, our implementation, lessons that we learned, important considerations, usage statistics, and then our end user feedback. And then you have all learned about the questions. We'll be answering questions at the end and in the chat. So that is our agenda for today, and I am hoping to provide you some more details as we go. Our learning objectives today will be describe how the end user and patient experience can improve workflow with a strong clinical communications platform. And I just want to stop there for a second because I really want you to focus on a few words in that sentence, uh, three in particular. The first word being end user, the second being patient, and the third being communication. Those three cl uh, critical elements have um, are everything that we do in healthcare. And many of you um, are aware of high, the high reliability um, organization platform that we're trying to move to. Anybody who's certified by Joint Commission understands that some of those key elements are that end user, the sharp end of the stick, the patient who we all put in the center, and then communication. Um, all of us who've done any type of RCA work, worked on HRO strategy, know that when you end up with your root cause analysis, many times communication, or almost all times, played a central role in, in um, wanting to do the right thing by our patients. So just a brief, um, you know, a moment to look at those three, how important they are, the end user, obviously patient, and then the communications platform. The second objective is to find how a clinical communications platform can be utilized within their organization. And the third is to apply design principles and implementation strategies and the development of their own implementation plan including times of the pandemic. 
A little bit about us, um, Sharp Healthcare, we're based in San Diego, California. We are a not-for-profit healthcare system with four acute care hospitals, three specialty hospitals, three affiliated medical groups, and a full spectrum of facilities and services. You'll hear us refer to the Metropolitan Campus later on in the presentation, and that consists of our largest acute care facility and two specialty hospitals for behavioral health and women's and children's. SHARP has an embedded um, philosophy. It's called the SHARP Experience. It's not just our brand, it's actually who we are. It's not one thing that we do, but it's everything that we do, treating people, not patients, and transforming the healthcare experience for our entire community. Um, a little bit um, a fun fact, because Jonathan will talk a little bit about the pandemic um, in, the, in our region, SHARP um, did see the largest amount of COVID patients throughout the region uh, on a numbered basis. And another little fun fact about SHARP, we have a border hospital that is very close to the largest land crossing uh, border in the world. And so um, just a fun fact about SHARP, we deployed Cerner's Classic Lab back in 1995, and about 20 years later brought up our acute and specialty hospitals on Cerner Millennium. Other solutions relevant to CareWare, including implementing are the Care Admin, Care Mobile Meds Barcoding in 2012, and then we went live with Infusion Suite in 2017. So those are just a few things about SHARP. And I will move on to the next slide. So again, why CareWare Connect Sharp? And besides what you see on the slide, just to make our end users' lives better, which I think we accomplished, we had two practical imminent needs. We needed to replace our dolphin devices that we were using for barcode um, medication administration that were at end of life and out of warranty in June of 2019. And we also had to replace our fleet of Cisco wireless phones that were frustrating to staff with a poor battery life and durability. A little bit about our, the Dolphin replacement. Um, we had hard, hardwired our best practices at our barcoding of meds at greater than 90% across the system. And we knew during the go live that we couldn't, um, we had to hold those gains and we couldn't decrease our numbers. So that was something that was our center focus in the replacement of the dolphins. The other about the Cisco uh, phones and the battery life, everyone knows that 12 hour shifts make it hard on battery life. But it was bigger than that. Um, there was a lot of battery replacement and a lot of uh, workarounds to get our batteries up and going all the time. So the nursing staff and everyone using the phones um, was having a source of frustration from that. And then the durability of those phones. Um, I'm a nurse by trade. I uh, worked hospital ops for 31 years, and I was the CNO at Sharp Chula Vista for 10 prior to my role that was in the slide that was presented today. And so I know a little bit about nursing, and nurses will try to resuscitate just about anything, including phones. And so I can tell you we had a lot of tape around our phones, uh, rubber bands, et cetera, et cetera. And besides the sanitary nature of the phones, um, we needed to move on from that uh, and get something a little more durable. The other um, thing that we really wanted to um, do is replace um, the replacement needed to be modern wireless phone that could replace four more or more devices carried by our care team at one time. Oftentimes, our paging workflows were inefficient and could possibly lead to error with putting in the wrong callback numbers. So the four things that we focused on at that time were the dolphins that I talked about a little earlier, our Cisco phones, pagers. Um, we had experienced delay from our towers um, at times, sometimes with a 10 minute plus delay or if the towers were down on our pager systems, and then cameras. Uh, nurses are pretty good with equipment and so is everyone else. But they would have to remember to go get the camera out of the drawer, go find it from someone else who was using the camera, because there was generally just one camera assigned to each unit. And then the process of uploading that information uh, seemed like a task. And there was always an expert that would gather a team around to remember how to upload the photos. 
And so those four things are really, when we talked about trying to make our end lives of our users better, we wanted to make sure we maintain their current best practice for rates of barcoding meds, um, get rid of some tape and rubber bands around their phones, um, stop the delays for the pagers, and give them something uh, readily available to replace their cameras. We had attempted back in 2016 to do a CareWare Connect um, pilot of two units, and at that time we realized we needed just one more thing to reach critical mass, and that one more thing was um, to int introduce an enterprise-wide HIPAA-compliant secure messaging platform. We also wanted uh, this to act as a catalyst for the future mobile innovation and, and delivery model that we saw in our vision for the future. And that HIPAA compliant secure messaging platform would be key to that and help people to look to the future for more innovation. So those were the keys. With that, I am going to hand over to Jonathan to take over the next slide on our behalf. Great, thank you. I'm here to share with you details around our project implementation. I'm going to talk about our strategies, our lessons learned, and then, of course, share some you should statistics as well. So project governance, one of the most important things you have to establish beyond why are we doing this. What you see here is the governance for our project. We had a core leadership team comprised of, thankfully, Chrissy, uh, Janet Hanley. She was our CNIO. And we also had director oversight from IT perspective. We brought in members to that core team, uh, myself included. We had a great, great project manager, Josh Beyer, running the show from the sharp side, teaming with the Cerner project manager as well. And we also had a position champion as part of that core team as well. We realized pretty quickly that implementing this, um, it's a, a very large feat, and you needed multiple work groups to tackle the problems at hand. So we had six work groups. One was focused on the technical infrastructure piece of this. Obviously, these are going to be mobile phones that have to be managed from an enterprise perspective. So there are multiple teams involved there, including network and telecom. We then had a team focused on the actual I. IT application. We have the mobile apps on the phone, but part of this ecosystem included mobile or applications on the desktop that also had to be set up, and managed, and configured. We also had a clinical work group. This work group was involved in many of the project milestones and meetings that we'd have. Uh, we used terms like current and future state review, uh, terms like data collection to collect user feedback. A lot of the, that group was there to uh, share, learn, and be part of those design phases. We then had a specific work group for our physicians uh, across the facilities. Um, we're looking to that group to help with engagement, facilitate communication, be champions, facilitate um, sign up, and we'll talk a little bit more about our strategy there later. Uh, we had our work group to look at metrics and reporting and understand what KPIs we could measure. And lastly, uh, one of our larger work groups was actually education and training which also included go live strategies, which in the time of a pandemic really um, shifted for us, which I'll talk about in more detail. Okay, let's talk about what we did and what we implemented. First off, just to normalize, uh, for those that, of you that may not be familiar with Cerner's mobile applications, on these handheld devices, we call them Zebra TC52s, just the manufacturer and the model number, we implemented five applications. We have Connect Nursing. This is going to be uh, for nurses and respiratory therapists, actually, where you get access to your care team through the lens of the patient. You understand who is providing care and you'll be able to message. Uh, you can review the chart and orders. You can look at your new orders and abnormal results. This is also going to be the vehicle for barcode meds administration. Um, and you could also use this to associate bedside monitors, so BMDI association as well. The next app was camera capture that was on the phone. This is what uh, Christy alluded to, alleviating some of the, we'll call it antiquated workflows and technology when it comes to capturing photos, primarily wound photos. Um, 
The next app we had was Connect Messenger, which is the secure messaging communication platform. And there were some unique features embedded in it, you know, including the ability to route alerts, which we did uh, at, from a pilot perspective, which I'll talk about briefly. You have access to your hospital's directory, which is where a lot of the design and data collection pieces come into. Um, and this is also going to be that vehicle where you could share photos and group messages um, and, and use it to be able to call anybody with, who's on that platform as well. The final app you see here, but don't plan to talk about it uh, throughout this presentation, was a replacement for um, Bridge Breast Milk. That's the application we use for human milk management. It was on a dolphin, and with the dolphins going away, we needed a modern solution for it. So what did this implementation cover and who? We had essentially two different go-lives. The first one was in October of 2019 for a Chula Vista campus. And the second one was in February of 2021. Together, we covered about 5,500. It's actually closer to 6,000 users that are on the platform. We covered about 175 departments and units. We deployed and now manage over 1,700 phones. And that last statistics you see here is just from a go live perspective, the IT and education and informatics teams uh, resolved and received uh, close to 600 issues. And a lot of it was actually just varying in nature. It might be technical questions, but if there wasn't a super user or a rounder there during Go Live, there was some education that we had to uh, round back on and develop strategies to get the message out. So sometimes it's easier to talk about a project after we're done. So what you see here. Um, as we do with all our projects, as we make a focused effort to pull on the project team and our stakeholders to understand lessons learned. So we wanted to share that with you guys directly. Um, the items in bold I'll talk about in more detail later on in the presentation. But overall, I'd say the key takeaway is that regardless of the technology implemented, many of the lessons learned you'll encounter are tied to people and process, not just the technology. So with this platform, on the surface, it seemed like we were just implementing something that people are used to in the consumer space. It's just messaging and calling. But in reality, it's so much more. This is a platform that you're not joining that already has millions of users. You're creating that user base. And it needs to be designed and accommodate your culture and communication structure as well, which may vary different, uh, vary from hospital to hospital or unit to unit depending on the need. We found that leveraging our super users and informatics teams were the key to that success in being able to not apply that technology to the people and adopt for processes as well. So some considerations. Uh, we had training hurdles because of COVID-19 and, and as well as staff burnout. We want to be really mindful, and our leaders were very sensitive to what we were placing in addition uh, to staff. We wanted to make our end users' lives better and not create some extra friction in their day-to-day -day operations. Um, we had to develop some focused strategies around physician engagement and adoption. This also tied a little bit to COVID-19 and burnout as well. I'll talk about that more in detail. We also we encountered a a uh, unique issue potentially to Sharp Healthcare because we're a regional uh, healthcare system where we knew going into this we were going to lose what we like to call dialing convenience to some degree. Um, the This current state with the Cisco phones prior to implementing this was you had the ability to do four or five digit extension dialing. Well, we were in a uni unique position where that dialing convenience was going to go away completely not because we wanted it to, but um, from a telecommunication standpoint, there were going to be restrictions due to area code overlaps. And if you take, say, a 619 area code and an 858 area code and you apply it to a region, you're going to have numbers overlap each other. And so there was a long-term plan from our telecom teammates to implement a, a new dialing plan, and we just happened to be at the forefront of that spear. Um, but this led to a greater need to 
teach best practices and leverage some of these unique tools found in the system to look someone up and call them directly, much like you do today, educating that. Do you know someone's number today when you call, call someone on your phone? You oftentimes take a message and reply or you have them as a favorite. So there are some best practices we are able to apply there to overcome that hurdle. As I mentioned before, these mobile apps have sort of partnered desktop applications at time or desktop alternatives in the case of Connect Messenger. So Stafflink was a tool that clerks would use to assign uh, nurses to a bed. And that way you know who's part of your care team, who's working with you on that unit, and it also would be the vehicle to route alerting if you needed. Um, so there was a lot of focus that we needed to spend on training the clerks because they were impacted um, by this implementation as well uh, when it comes to calls being routed appropriately and also just using this platform to uh, improve uh, quick messaging workflows, which we'll talk about. Um, one of the challenges, and it's more of just where along in your project this falls, but having this in your hand during the design conversations is really important. Sometimes you need to see it, to believe it, and to understand that it's real. Uh, having that equipment in hand, we were able to expedite that, and that's what we could apply to our COVID-19 sort of strategy around training. Um, but the quicker you can get that, and sometimes there's technology and architecture barriers to that, um, the better for um, people, again, understanding that this is coming and this is what it feels like, uh, and it's real. Um, because of resource limitations uh, from end users and super users, um, and just some barriers into getting in units, et cetera. With our Metropolitan Campus Go Live, we did find that there were a lot of uh, changes we had to make at Go Live. You know, luckily this was a system that allowed for that flexibility, but then there's always that um, extra hurdle of going back and retraining. Um, but, you know, just acknowledging the fact that depending on your timing, um, you may not be able to get all the feedback and design you need, um, even at multiple iterations of testing and review. Um, it's just something we had to acknowledge. The other piece is, what happens when something goes wrong and something goes down? I'll talk about our downtime journey uh, a little bit, but these are smartphones, and they need the wireless network to work. Um, unlike your personal phone, these don't have SIM cards, so it's not working off a carrier network. Um, even though it's assumed and there's best practices and strategies in place already, digging those up and make sure, making sure you teach to those will be very important as well. Because again, these are just critical communication tools and we want to make sure everybody understands what to do and we need to make it simple. Um, one last consideration is when you roll these out, we rolled out 1,700 phones, so you have to understand the ergonomics and the footprint of it. The Zebra devices themselves um, are, I'd say, not that much bigger than, uh, say, one of the larger smartphones on the market, but they are robust, so it's like that smartphone has a case. But when you have to charge it, it takes up a lot of space. So some areas and some sort of uh, unit build may not have that space. So you have to be creative and make sure you do your detailed walkthroughs to understand are cabinets needed. Um, do you, can you work off just battery exchanges, which often happens on our nursing units? Um, but that took a lot of detail and evaluation as well. All right, key successes from our lessons learned. Number one, in order to build this out, we found that you had to have detailed breakout sessions, unit to unit, department to department, and it needed to be done almost in interview fashion. Um, this is a very large initiative, but to have 80 people on a call, even though there's things that you can learn from each other, that didn't work when it came to understanding a specific unit's workflow and the nuances behind it. So this was a key success where we had informatics partners that were able to conduct these interviews. And I have some more detail I can share with you on that later as well. Um, despite living in an electronic world, having physical resource binders available was very important, including flyers and bulletins. 
Um, camera capture, I think it now goes without saying, it was a huge incentive. Um, it was a quick win, especially for the wound team, and it just immediately made people's lives easier. We also had to walk into this with an updated system policy around hospital-based smartphones and messaging. Uh, it, it includes some um, recommendations on do's and don'ts, uh, what to do for shifts, what messages can be sent, what's the appropriate use for hospital-based smart smartphones as well. Lastly, this is something you have to plan for ample go-live support, and you want it to be as seamless as possible. And that's where um, I think COVID-19 made it a little challenging because Historically, we are used to being there shoulder to shoulder. So we had to quickly adopt a method to round with users and share information real time um, and report issues. So let's talk about our approach. The, we'll call it the COVID-19 new approach. What we did, rather than bring in like we've done in the past, every end user for training. So at Chula Vista, we had large conference rooms. Every end user was able to come in. Phones were in front of them, and we were able to walk through a couple hours of class. We had to focus on our super users and clerks. So that's a subset of the group. Um, there still was maybe uh, between 100 and 200. They were prioritized for in-person training, where we had to adhere to our social distancing guidelines and restrictions. We then had a hybrid approach for our end users. We have our online training modules that were created covering the, uh, the mobile applications they'd be using. Um, it's divvied up by job code and it can be monitored by our education staff. And then we rolled out on-site skill assessment stations. Um, these had to be put in strategic locations and they actually, there actually were more than 100 where there was a checklist it was there to, uh, for units to help manage individual competency and uh, complete skills evaluations um, on each site. And we did have to leave it up to the units to complete that, and oftentimes we'd see an educator take charge. The other challenge was our command center. You know, we are getting, you're bringing up several thousand people on this, and you have to be able to uh, triage and troubleshoot these quickly. So every huddle we had had to be remote. Typically, in the past, they were in person, um, as Chrissy remembers. Uh, sometimes those in-person huddles get a little loud, so that actually is a benefit of having it remote. You can keep volume down in hallways as you spill over because you'd have 40 to 80 people there. Um, we had to train all of our IT and education staff remotely, um, and we made sure that we had a, a very small physical IT presence on the site because these are phones. They can be, as we like to say, handsy. You sometimes have to put your hands on, even, there, even though there are remote, remoting in capabilities. Um, but ultimately, we couldn't have as many people on site. Therefore, everything we did was relatively virtual when it came to troubleshooting. If we needed to deploy someone there, we could. We also found that there was just a shortage of staff like everyone felt during this time. Ideally, we would have loved to pull super users out of staffing, but we couldn't. They were needed for patient care. We even had our EMR training staff, our IT staff volunteering to assist in the hospitals uh, as much as possible. So we were able to pull in outside of resources that we had to board rather quickly and educate. Um, and in total, I'd say, we had close to 50 people uh, working eight-hour shifts for 24 hours for about 10 days uh, in order to support this effort. So changing gears a little bit, position adoption and engagement, I mentioned it above in the considerations. Typically, educating physicians um, depending on what you're educating, it can prove challenging as you are competing for time. Um, this rollout provided no exception to that. And what we landed on really was a one-page flyer that can be electronic or paper. Um, Cerner was able to help produce it with us so we can make it um, visually um, striking and appealing. But here it gives you essentially self-service. What are the key features? What are you getting it? How can I get it? What does it do for me? How can I access it? Um, this also was accompanied by 
um, YouTube videos that are two minutes or less uh, that we were able to put, we call it a vanity URL, so it would be very easy and memorable for people to get to it, or we could even scan a QR code for people to access it on their mobile phone. And then just like we talked about with these enterprise devices, it's what else is there that's going to benefit their workflow? Um, Cerner's application for physicians, mobile application, is called PowerChart Touch. This is where orders can be entered, charts can be reviewed, but it also gave them insight into the care team. And tied to that care team would be everybody on the Care Connect messaging ecosystem. So I can text a nurse caring for the patient. I can call them. I can understand who the respiratory therapist is. And that was a huge one as well. We found for training, um, despite rolling this out uh, in this manner, we still had to rely on just-in-time education and, uh, for lack of a better phrase, peer pressure. Um, and for many sort of uh, service lines, it needed to be grassroots. And the value in this was making sure the whole hospital was on the platform and not one specific group. Uh, one of our lessons learned was that, uh, about a year in advance, we wanted to make sure that secure messaging was available, which was HIPAA compliant to our providers. So that platform um, was released, but the added value becomes your, your staff and care team members on this platform. And so it took a little bit of that sort of grassroots uh, message to get out there before we saw increased adoption from the physician side. Okay, one of the other considerations, downtime process. Again, it doesn't seem like much, but you gotta have a backup to a backup to a backup plan. So what you see here is kind of how it started. When we first went live at Chula Vista, we had a series of workouts and IT led it. And that's why you see a really fancy complex grid that you see here. Um, it meant a lot to me, but it meant really nothing to our end users. Uh, it was way too complex. Um, messaging when there's a doubt, downtime or an outage, it needs to be simple. Um, you have all these workflows, clinical workflows and tasks that you need to complete, but what's the number one objective? I want to make a phone call and be able to communicate to, uh, to someone when I need to, to do that. So despite the complexities of a system, we had to boil this down into essentially a one pager. And you can see a screenshot of that here. Um, ideally, uh, if there's a downtime, uh, it's where can I go? And someone's going to try and reach for anything that's available, whether it's a personal phone or a red phone, a bat phone. But we found if there is, uh, say, a Wi-Fi issue, um, it did lead to a little bit of panic. So this is what this aimed to help prevent. Um, what can and can I not do if there's a Wi-Fi outage and I try to make a phone call, where can I go to next? One of the advantages of this particular platform and phone would be if I can't look up a person's name and number and call it, and there could be a couple reasons behind that, as long as I had wireless, I can dial a number and make a phone call. So that led us to building out, uh, at first, a custom downtime directory to where I have access to the Internet, Therefore, I can pull up a directory that's there and use it through a web app to make a phone call. Because, uh, again, it's, I need to talk to somebody now, and maybe I don't have time to reach out to, a, um, to get to a landline that might be still available at that time. So this journey actually um, took us, in partnership with Cerner, into integrating this now into the voice app. So there's an additional level of redundancy where even if there's – say, an application outage, and in the rare event there might be a Cerner downtime, you now have the ability to look someone up and call them from the phone because the phone is going to act as a phone. I think the term is pickle phone uh, behind that. So that was one, uh, I think, um, great process improvement and technological improvement we saw since being uh, live is, again, these, these phones have to work. They have to reach somebody. Um, and in partnership with Cerner, we're, we were able to improve that process. Okay, usage statistics. Uh, this graph represents the total secure messages uh, per month across all of our facilities. Uh, we started going live uh, end of October 2019, so you can see some of the training usage in August and September. 
And then you have sustained volume up until February, which is when we went live with our Metro campus. Um, the orange line you see indicates the number of active users on this platform, which you can see follows this text messaging trends. So this boils down to about 7,000 or more secure messages sent per day within our organization. That's 200,000 a month. And to date, since going live in October, we've sent over 2.4 million secure messages. One of the interesting trends that uh, you don't see graphed here is that the number of calls placed on the platform almost identically mirror the number of text messages sent. So I mentioned we have about 200,000 text messages sent per month. We get about 200,000 calls placed on the platform as a, mo a month. And it was interesting to see that these trends, they, they really reached critical mass and sustainment rather quickly, as you can see even with the text message graphs here. Um, once people started using it, they used it, and you didn't see much deviation from these usage statistics since. So quickly talking about who used it, uh, not surprising nurses. They're a top uh, position that uh, were using the platform. Then uh, we saw clerks as our number two users, the lab, pharmacy, uh, women's health nurse, and Cerner, we have to break it out by a different position. That's why you see that there, but there was a very strong adoption um, in our women's health units. Uh, we also saw uh, a close to the top five respiratory therapy up there as well. Um, this is there just to remind you of that ecosystem that's being created. You know, Oftentimes, the focus might be on provided at nurse workflows and communication, but the ancillary service lines are just as important and will be communicating quite heavily on this sort of platform if you have or choose to implement something like it. Um, the below statistics are images and users. So it takes a snapshot of Chula Vista. We've had over 11,000 images taken on this platform, and you see 1,400 users. So we went from having one phone available potentially per unit, sorry, one, one point and shoot camera available per unit. That camera, once you took a photo, you had to take the memory card out of it. You had to plug the camera into uh, a PC. You might have to be on your hands and knees to do that, depending on where that computer was. Um, therefore, you, it was limited usage, limited users, uh, a lot of time and uh, spent a lot of waste. So you could see how quickly um, this uh, camera capture platform was adopted at Sharp Chula Vista and also the rest of our organization. Really quickly, talking about meds barcoding. You know, as, as Christy mentioned, we wanted to make sure we had our high rates of medication administration um, scanning uh, sustained through this endeavor. Um, these graphs, what it really shows you is that You'll see the top right, bottom left, and the bottom right for Mesa Vista, Memorial Infusion, and Mary Birch. These were the facilities that used the dolphins uh, almost close to 50%, if not more. And these dolphins were then replaced by CareWare Connect. Um, so it was great to see that this process and workflow quickly transferred over to the new device. And just to normalize you a little bit as well, the term care admin that you see, so that's the, the dark blue uh, color, those are the PC scanners that would be tied to the computer. So that's kind of the traditional method outside of the handheld devices for uh, barcode scanning. Care mobile in the orangish color, those, that's the Dolphin platform. That's the, the Cerner solution term for it, care mobile. And then Connect, of course, would be the, the smartphone rollout that we did. All right, additional considerations in your project and rollout. I mentioned our informatics team and partnering with them, it was pivotal for implementation effort. Um, the, the ability for that group to have those one-on-one -on -one interview questions to round out your design and data collection work group was very, very important. So some questions they might ask, as you see here, 
be how many staff members do you have at the busiest time of your day? What are the number of nurses? Because this goes into how many devices you need to deploy. Um, who are the dedicated members of your department? Because one advantage of this platform now would be um, you can claim a role. So if you are the respiratory therapist uh, working on a unit, all of a sudden you know who that respiratory therapist is already. Um, that's what roles would do for you. Um, are your staff reachable by an outside phone number? And from a telecom perspective, you have some flexibility on making the phones uh, work within your four walls or outside your full four walls. So those were considerations as well. And I think one of the most important questions we learned was, who do you call frequently? What are those numbers? Because we want to be able to build that dialing convenience and speed dials um, to ultimately uh, drive people to uh, efficient calling workflows, which was very, very important. The other uh, consideration around the rollout is understanding and being sensitive to what it's going to take to update the device. Um, there's software on these phones, just like your phones at home. So if I need to update, these are Android devices, what's that going to look like? What's the impact to the end user? Um, this is a slight paradigm shift when it comes to maintaining PCs. I, I think for us in our organization, people are used to, okay, maybe on Thursdays I take a Windows update because that ha happens automatically. Well, now if someone's in the middle of a phone call, what do we do here? Um, so these were strategies that we're still developing and we're getting close to um, a uh, final proposal uh, that really uh, these updates can happen behind the scenes minimize impact to end users so that there's no sort of interruption in clinical communication, but it does need some time spent on it. So the other piece is this was a project that, as you can see, spanned multiple years because of the focus on different campuses. Um, we now have a project focused on two of our other facilities, Sharp Grossman and Sharp Coronado. So we have our project steering and members focused there but we can't forget about operations because we have sites live. So you want to make sure you have a plan for the timing and when it makes sense to stand up an operational steering committee. So we technically now have two steering committees, if you will. We have a project steering committee focused on rolling out the platform to our last two uh, acute care hospitals. And now we have an operational steering committee that has members of the project steering committee on it um, although sometimes you don't know what you don't know, but we have to make sure that there's communication established between these two groups. So the focus of our operational steering committee, which has membership across the, from across the system, which uh, in a way is challenging because this touches nearly every department. Um, but the focus is going to be on strengthening adoption, enhancing standardization of workflows, ensuring we get the maximum performance on the platform, and we're supporting and improving communication and clinical workflows across our clinical teams. So any sort of workflow barrier that we're seeing is brought here, any technical barrier, um, clear communication out with respect to what features might be coming. This, the one difference with this sort of mobile platform, just to be aware of as well, is that the mobile space, you see more frequent updates. So that will challenge and potentially change the method in which training is delivered. Um, you know, the new push you'll see would be maybe uh, in-app or training, so you'll get prompts within your application, which could change what you do. But if you're getting features and innovation released constantly, say not on a quarterly cycle, but on a weekly cycle, you have to make sure you have the right structure in place uh, behind that as well to test, review, and, and make sure that these features get released to the benefit of um, all the end users. So with that slide, Christy, I'm going to turn it back over to you to talk about the game changers we saw with implementing this clinical communication platform. Thank you, Jonathan. So we saw many gains, and I'm hoping you've heard um, several of them throughout our discussions, but the main Number one, eliminates the non-HIPAA compliant personal cell phone use for messaging providers, administration, and clinical staff. That was a really important gain for us. Also combines voice, messaging, 
barcoding and camera and certain elements of the patient chart for quick access to patient information and rapid communication to staff caring for those patients. Camera capture has nearly eliminated a manual process for uploading wound photos which has sparked some more innovations around other things people may want to uh, capture on uh, photos since it's so easy to use now and, and efficient. It can untether your bedside or your people at the point of care from barcoding workflows from the PC, smart programming workflows where patient's bed is in between the pump and the PC. And we noticed that in the beginning when we first went live Sometimes the patient's armband would be on one side and the PC would be on the other side and the uh, nurse would be running back and forth around the, the, around the bed. Um, good for getting steps, but not so efficient. Uh, excellent uh, innovation was the sepsis alert can route to our sepsis nurses. We realize not everybody has sepsis nurses, but you can understand how important that would be providing patient context and critical information to the person who needs it. Um, a message versus a page to an on-call MD allows for more information to be relayed and for direct callback of the user when not urgent. And this has been highly beneficial to the project. And a few more. Texting allows for fewer phone call interruptions for routine updates and questions, reduces in-room interruptions when providing patient care, or in, say, for example, someone in a procedure. Our physicians really love the MD to MD messaging regarding consults, which can help them speed up patient assessment time. There's less call routing through the operator or clerk. A robust directory allows nearly anyone to be called or messaged if known by role, like a charge nurse or an individual by name. Specific care team members can also be identified and messaged by patient lookup. We've also created and streamlined an efficient approach to patient care and coordination with our pharmacy, lab, case management, or therapists, for example, can send updates from a desktop or mobile device, re reducing phone calls and interruptions. And a user can quickly transition to a phone call from a message string when needed. So those are a variety of different examples that we were hoping to share with you so you could see some of the gains and benefits that we have made. And then lastly, we um, have an, our end user feedback slide to share with you. And I think this is one of the most important slides, which brings us back to the beginning of our presentation when we were talking about um, our objectives and our goals when we really wanted to make sure we always put our patients at the center at everything we do. And those caring for those patients want to make sure that happens. And then the end user, just making our end users' lives better because they are the sharp end of the stick when you're talking about high reliability science. And we want to make sure that those people that are providing those, um, that care to our patients that are so precious to us can do the important work that they need in the most efficient manner. And that is, was the key. And, and improving that communication also helps to make a more safer environment all, overall. So having this feedback from our end users was just such a, a delight and a highlight of the entire project. And you all know that our goal from the beginning was to make their lives easier. And one of the key things that we did to see, you know, now that you have, you know, these smartphones that are new, which were not band-aided together, um, can we take those phones away from you? That was a key question. Could you do without them once you have them? And the answer was, um, was overwhelmingly no. We, we want them, they work, we want to keep them, and we, we just can't do without them any longer. When we went live at the Metro campus that uh, Jonathan was talking about earlier, we had so many positive stories uh, from day one. Oftentimes with some of these new transformative uh, technologies that we implement, that's not the case. But this time we heard um, goal that our goal was uh, was met. That we did with the high adoption rates meet the goal of making our end users' lives better. And so with that, just a few of the uh, highlights were uh, nice for just everyone. And clerks, there's a bullet to the uh, to the left that says, "I love my computer. I can just text away." 
it's so nice to sit at a desktop and not have to call overhead paging for a nurse, for example, if a patient needed to get up to the restroom or needed some pain medicine. The clerk, instead of paging overhead, could just send that nurse a quick secure text that your patient in such and such room needs X. And that's that. It's done. It goes right to the phone. And the overall ability just to text was amazing. And um, they're available for you to look at a few of these. I love receiving calls from users with positive feedback uh, that they like the new devices. And texting between the different subgroups was um, very uh, well enhanced. The nursing assistant and RN communication improved. MDRN communication streamlined and improved. So with that, um, I would like to thank everyone for listening in on our presentation. And we hope that presenting our CareWare Connect implement, implementation story proves helpful to all of you and can complement your own journey. And we are now open for questions and see some questions that have been in the chat box. And we want to thank you very much. Thank you both for a great presentation. You obviously hit on a lot of things that really got people to ask questions. I always think it's a sign of a good presentation when you get a bunch of questions. So uh, Jonathan has been answering a lot of the more technical questions here uh, as we're going through. Um, one of the things that I want to touch on was some that, something that just came in that I think would be applicable to everybody, and that is you know, how does all of this connect to and improve patient safety, improve event reporting? Because, you know, we know, and we were talking even before the presentation, Chrissy, that an improved communication leads to improved patient safety and improved uh, quality of care. So have you seen anything there? Have you done any uh, study on that in your system? Yes, um, I, we, we recognize that improved patient safety is our number one goal. And so we have been on the HRO journey for some time. And we watch our, um, our SSER rates, our serious safety events rates, and all rates, just like most systems do. And so the data collected from our phone usage and our communication. So with any event we may have, um, our goal would be to prevent any event with increased communication and um, increased direct communication. I did uh, see an earlier question about using team steps. SHARP does use team steps in many situations. And the ability to text directly critical information um, from one provider to another without waiting for phone calls or without waiting has definitely improved our ability to get, we also use SBAR, um, and definitely improved our ability to get to the end user as quickly as possible between nurses and physicians, um, et cetera. But SHARP has a robust, um, we call it real learning solutions instead of quality variance reporting. So we track all of our variance reports and our communication strategies against those reports as it relates to HRO, and it also relates to um, evaluate our root cause analysis, and we have noticed directly our SSER rates trending downward over time. Our serious safety event rates have, uh, and that's something we monitor at our HRS during meeting monthly. I hope that answers the question. I think so. Yeah, I think it's a great, it's a great answer. Uh, so I'm seeing through Jonathan's responses now. You know, this was really a big bang rollout that went to everybody that is touching really all units and facilities that are a part of the system. So in doing that, um, were there any pockets of resistance um, or any groups that it was just harder for them to make the transition? So not individuals so much, but is it just certain departments that maybe people should watch out for or was everything equally uh, as smooth? That's a very good question. Um, everything isn't always equal. 
when it comes to sure. um, <laughs> the adoption. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think one of the lessons learned, and we could have provided it, is you are changing thousands of people's phone numbers. One of the difference in this platform is people no longer you used to pick up a phone and you were that phone's phone number. Now you're picking up a phone and you're you, and you have a phone number. Mm-hmm. So the directory and everyone's numbers completely changed. So there were some areas at the very beginning that we um, knew about but maybe reached them too early where we said, your directory is going to change. So that's one of the challenges. Find all the different directories and where phone numbers are, and they all need to be updated. So partnering with PBX is really important (laughs) for that. Um, So, you know, whether it be supply chain or biomed or engineering, um, all those phone numbers need to be reviewed. And I think the pockets where you really want to kind of work on end user education and understanding clinical communication workflows would be high turnover areas. Um, You know, ED is a good focus. Um, Working with your ED providers and hospitalists potentially for what does uh, the admission process and patient admission process look like. Oftentimes there can be complexity in that space, especially with um, if you have sort of a provider scheduling system that's currently used. Uh, There's a potential to integrate that. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to do that in time uh, once it was released, but there would be advantages there. And also really working closely with, say, um, ORs, periop areas, uh, when it comes to those voice communication workflows, because, again, you don't want to make calling over, overly complex. You want to make it efficient. Um, and there are tips and tricks that can be used. Um, And a lot of that goes with making sure that you provide that education and time for people to use it before you go live. Thank you. That is a a great answer. Um, We are getting close to the end here. So I think the question that I'd like to ask is uh, one that wasn't asked, but uh, was there anything that, were there any outcomes of this? That positive outcomes of this that surprised you, that you thought, wow, that that was better than I thought it would be, or that was, you know, that affected something that I didn't think would affect it that well. I I believe because we've done a lot of big go lives at Sharp, and this go live really impacted the direct caregivers in so many positive ways to make their lives just generally easier, that they could do the work that they needed to do. And oftentimes, we give the direct caregivers more to do. And this time, we we really accomplished efficiencies where they could decrease some of their workload and make their workflows easier and more efficient and give them their time back so they could spend that time with the patients. That's great. All right. Well, um, I think all the other questions are very technical, and I like ending on that nice note. So um, I think that I'd like to thank everybody for participating today uh, that came on, and especially all the folks that asked all the great questions. Uh, And hopefully we got most of your questions answered for you. Uh, Jonathan, you are going through those in an amazing pace. So I'm very impressed with that because I thought there's no way we're going to get to all these questions. So thank you for doing that. And um, I'd like to thank the folks from Cerner for uh, being involved with this and sponsoring today's webinar. And Christy and Jonathan, thank you both for the great presentation and for all the work you're doing for Sharp and, and for sharing with us today. That was great. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. We appreciate everybody. Thank you. This concludes today's webinar. You may now disconnect and log off.